Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, go ahead and take your Bibles, uh, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Okay, so if you don't have a Bible with you or an app with you, there are Bibles under every two or third chair, um, second or third chair, so feel free to grab that if you don't have one. Uh, If you don't have a Bible at home, grab that Bible from underneath the chair, and at the end of the service, tuck it underneath your arm and walk home with it. Go home with it, because we want everybody to have a Bible at their house. We want you to have something that you can read and refer to and study. Uh, So consider that our gift to you. Uh, Now, if you're looking for 1 John, it's towards the end of the Bible. You could actually go to the last book of the Bible, which is Revelation, and go forward a few books, and you'll hit 1 John. If you get to James or Hebrews, you've gone too far, and you need to go back towards the back, Uh, but it's right there in that area towards the back side, the end uh, of the Bible. So 1 John chapter 1. Now, let me start out my message by taking a, a quick survey. Raise your hand if you are completely perfect without any character flaws. If that's you, raise your hand. No? Why am I the only one raising my hand right now? Because I'm lying to you. That's right. I am not perfect. I have my own set of character flaws. But did you notice that no one in here went, oh, yeah, that's me. Oh, wait, maybe, maybe not. We don't even think about that. Our minds don't even think that we're perfect without any character flaws because we're so far from being perfect. We are all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all mess up, don't we? We, we all end up hurting people at times because we mess up or we make mistakes or we sin. Um, our, our mistakes and our sins affect those around us. Um, so I think that's a good starting point. So we can all admit that, right? We're, we're none of us are perfect. None of us are without some kind of character flaws. So we can, we can start there. So if we start there and we all recognize that, why is it that we're so wired and so quick to blame others? Aren't we? I mean, we're kind of ingrained. We're kind of by human nature We know we're not perfect, but we refuse to admit that we're not perfect when we mess up, right? I mean, we are so quick to throw or cast the blame on other people. Psychologically, this is called a defense mechanism. Your brain is hardwired to defend itself, to make us look better to the world around us, to to not admit faults. Uh, you're, you're hardwired psychologically and mentally to do that. Now, spiritually, we know that it's sin. Sin has corrupted us. It has damaged us. It has made us uh, faulty. And so when we blame others, that is sin being expressed in our life. Uh, it's just the way we think. And think about it for a second. We've done this from the beginning, the, the moment that sin came into the world, haven't we? So think back to Genesis, very beginning book of the Bible. Chapters one through three tells us about creation and Adam and Eve. So chapter one is all about the six days of creation, uh, that God created the world and everything in the universe in six days. Then chapter two begins with on the seventh day, he took a rest, he took a Sabbath. And then it goes into a little more detail about how specifically he created man. And then you get into chapter three and it tells the story about Adam and Eve being in the Garden of Eden, this perfect paradise garden. And God gives them one rule. He says, you can eat Anything that's in the garden, eat from any tree that's in this garden except that tree over there. That one tree, don't eat from it. That's my rule. Don't eat from this tree. And what did Adam and Eve do? They ate from that tree. Those morons ate from that tree and screwed everything up for us. Let's be honest. If we were in the garden, we would have eaten from the tree too, wouldn't we? Yeah. Stop casting blame on Adam and Eve. It would have been you too. So they eat from the tree 
And then they realize they're guilty, so go, they go and hide from God, as if you can hide from God. And so God starts walking through the garden and is looking for Adam and Eve. Now, let's be honest. Again, God knew exactly where they were at, didn't he? He was kind of playing a game with them. So he finds them, and he confronts them about their sin. And here's what he says. Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, Adam says, the woman whom you gave me, you see what Adam did there? That woman that you put in the garden, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. You see what Adam did? One sentence, he cast blame on two individuals. God says, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat from? And Adam immediately says, this is your fault, God, because you gave me that woman. She ate the fruit and then gave me some. I am blameless here, right? That's what he does, doesn't he? But if you go on to read chapter three, God passes down three curses, or, or passes down curses to three individuals. He curses the serpent that had tempted Eve, he, t he curses Eve and he curses Adam because he was completely at fault. If you really read Genesis 3 in, in, in depth, it's pretty clear that Adam was sitting there the whole time and didn't say a word while Eve was being tempted. In other words, he was listening and watching what was taking place and not once did Adam go, hey Eve, um, yeah, this is a bad idea. Let's walk away from this. But the moment he gets called out for his fault, for his sin, what does he do? You gave me this woman who caused me to sin. This is not my fault. You see, blame wasn't the first sin, but boy, it came right after, didn't it? He jumps right in to blaming everyone but himself for the fall. So we're wired. Our sin has wired us to blame others and play the victim card. Now, let me clarify something very quickly before I move forward uh, any more with this. I'm not talking about being a legitimate victim. If you are a victim of a crime or of abuse or manipulation or you've been taken advantage of and you're a victim, I'm not saying you're to blame. There are instances where you are legitimately a victim and that is not your fault. You are not to blame if you are a victim of some kind of crime or abuse. That is not on you. So do not hear me in saying that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the instances where we find ourselves in difficult circumstances because of the poor decisions we made and then we try and blame someone else because we're stupid. That's what I'm talking about. I am not talking about you if you are a legitimate victim of a crime uh, or of manipulation or abuse. That's a totally different thing, okay? So now that we've clarified that, let me move into the idea that I want us to wrap our heads around this morning, wrap our hearts and our heads around. And it's this statement right here. The freeway to freedom is blocked by blame. The freeway to freedom is blocked by blame. You see, we're in a series right now called Freeway, and it's all about becoming free spiritually, emotionally, mentally, financially, physically. Freedom can be found through God, but if you're on the freeway to the destination, your end destination is freedom, you will never reach that destination if you're a blamer, if you play the blame game. Blame blocks us from accessing the freedom that God has for us. Sometimes we need to take a painful look in the mirror. Sometimes we need to realize that we've been playing the blame game and we need to step out of it. I don't do quotes a whole lot, but there's a quote that Theodore Roosevelt said that just fits this so perfectly. He says, if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, 
you wouldn't sit for a month. (laughs) And isn't that true? Because if you were to honestly take a look at your past and the difficult circumstances that you found yourself in, in in different moments of your life, the vast majority of those difficult moments, you could trace back to your own poor decisions or sin. You could. Yeah, I, I took a hard look at my own life in writing this sermon and realized that pretty much every difficult situation except one that I found myself in was a result of what I had done the decisions I had made, the sins I had committed. And so we've already said that we're imperfect. We've already admitted that we have our faults. So why do we so quickly jump to blame? Well, I think that it's wrapped up in fear. I think we fear two primary things, and those two fears cause us to blame. to to play the blame game. And those two fears are this. We're afraid that if we own up to our lives and the mistakes we've made, if we own up, we're afraid that we're gonna look bad to those around us. We wanna save face. We wanna look good to ourselves and to the people around us, and we're afraid if we own up that we're gonna look bad. But here's the thing. What looks worse to the people around you when you fess up and say, I messed up, I'm gonna make this right, or when someone else finds out you're right and wrong and calls you out on it. Think about it, in politics, for example. Who do we despise more? The politician that comes out and says, I messed up, I'm gonna resign and step away and I'm gonna fix the mistake I made, or the politician that gets caught and says, I didn't do it, it was their fault. Who do we despise more? The second guy, right? Whether we like it or not, as messed up as our society is, our society still admires honesty and transparency, doesn't it? It admires those of us who step up and say, I've wronged you, or I've made a mistake, or I've sinned, and I'm gonna do my best to make this up to you. Our society admires that behavior, doesn't it? So the fear of looking bad is irrational and doesn't make any sense. The second fear that keeps us from owning up is we're afraid to be uncomfortable. And God forbid, as Americans, that we be uncomfortable for any amount of time, right? I mean, if I go through the drive-thru at In-N-Out and it takes more than five minutes to get my food, somebody's going to hear about it because I'm uncomfortable and I'm not getting my way. But the fact of the matter is, is that uncomfortable is not what, uh, comfort is not what we're guaranteed as followers of Christ, is it? As a matter of fact, Christ guarantees that if we are his followers, we're going to go through persecution and discomfort. But think about it this way. If you're afraid of the discomfort that you will have to go through because you own up to the mistake or the sin that you committed, And so you cast blame on someone else, who then has to deal with that discomfort? The person that we just cast that blame on. Is that ever right for us to make someone else deal with what we should be dealing with? To take the consequences we should have to go through and make someone else deal with our consequences? Is that ever the right thing to do? No. I mean, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. Guys, I don't know about you, but I don't want to pay the price or deal with the discomfort for something that someone else did that I had no part of. So casting blame, those two fears of uh, losing face, of, of not looking good in front of others and to ourselves, and the fear of discomfort, are either one of those things the right attitude to have? No. Biblically or not, that's not the right thing to do. Culturally, biblically, both agree that that's the wrong way to approach life, okay? So, casting blame is not the right step. We can all agree on that. Taking ownership is the right thing to do. But here's the hard question. I can talk to you about taking ownership, but how? Do you take ownership? How do I take ownership 
of the things we do, the things we say, the mistakes we make, the sins we commit. How do we do that? Well, that's where the Bible comes in. Take your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1. That's where I told you to turn at the beginning. 1 John chapter 1. Now, the reference that I have on the screen is 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, but we're going to read verses 8, 9, and 10, okay? Because 9 is where I want to focus, but 8, 9, and 10, all three uh, are uh, on the same idea and the same uh, theme. So let's look at all three of those. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. Here we go. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Okay, stop there. That's what we've been talking about so far this morning, right? That if we think that we are perfect and we don't have character flaws and we never sin and never make mistakes, verse eight says we're deceiving ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse nine, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, three sentences, amazing passage, uh, amazing truth that is found in this very small amount of scripture. The fact of the matter is, is there's more hope in this one sentence than we find in almost any part of our lives. Think about it. This basically says that when we mess up, when we sin, when we go against God, if we'll simply confess that mistake, that sin, that disobedience, if we'll simply confess God through his faithfulness and his justice will forgive us. Now, do we deserve, have we done anything to earn that forgiveness? No. But God gives it to us anyway. He doesn't get us what we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve. That amazing grace that we just sung about, that's what he gives us, even though we don't deserve it. Even though we shouldn't receive it, that's what he gives us. But it's not just that. Through his faithfulness and his justice, he will forgive us of our sins and also cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. In other words, he doesn't just forgive, he cleanses. He cleans it up. He cleans our hearts, our minds, the corruption that we have. The act of confessing our sin opens the door for God to forgive and cleanse and purify us. And guys, I don't know about you, but that is so much hope in one sentence. The fact that even though I don't deserve it, God will forgive me and cleanse me if I just take my sin to him. So what does this tell us to do? I'm gonna give you three steps to taking ownership. And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where we apply what the Bible says and the concept of not casting blame, but instead taking ownership for our lives. Now, on a side note, and Chad has mentioned this all uh, every time he's preached on this series, these three steps actually come right out of our Celebrate Recovery program. And if you're looking for a way to gain emotional and spiritual freedom in your life, Celebrate Recovery would be a great way for you to do that. They meet every Monday night at 6.30 over on our McCulloch campus. The address is in your bulletin and on our website. 6.30 on Monday nights. And there are steps that they take us through to help us gain freedom from our addictions, our habits, our hurts, uh, the pain that we go through, uh, the blame game. Um, And these three that I'm going to give you is part of the step process that you would walk through and celebrate recovery. Um, So if you're looking for that, Monday nights at 630, I would encourage you to go. So steps to taking ownership. Step one is stop blaming God and others for your circumstances. Stop blaming God and others for your circumstances. 
as appealing as blame may be, it doesn't help the situation, does it? Because in the moment when you blame someone for something you've caused, when you cast that blame in that exact moment, it makes you feel good temporarily. But what does it do to you emotionally and spiritually long term? If we're sitting here talking about taking the freeway to freedom and that the end result, the end goal is to be free in Jesus Christ through God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If that's the end goal, then when we cast blame on someone else, rather than moving towards freedom, we shackle ourselves to the blame and the lies that we tell ourselves and we tell others. You see, the the blame game doesn't free us. The blame game imprisons us. And so maybe it's time that all of us in this room take a good hard look emotionally, spiritually, mentally in the mirror. So how do we do that? How do we stop blaming God and others for our, our own circumstances? Well, I think it starts with the question. Look back at your life. Stop with me for just a second. Everybody think back at your life. And I want you to simply ask this question. In all the different circumstances that you've gone through, the difficult times, who have you tended to blame? Who have you been blaming through your life? Is it a boss or a coworker or an employee? Is it a parent? Is it a child? Is it a spouse? I mean, that's what Adam did, right? That woman that you gave, she messed it up. He blamed his spouse. Now, did that help him? (laughs) No, it cursed him. So the fact is, is that we have a tendency to blame, and we've got to figure out who it is that we have a tendency to turn to and cast that blame on. Here's a harder one. Do you tend to blame God for your circumstances? Do you tend to say, this is your fault, God? Or do you look in the mirror? Do you realize that the blame falls on us, on me, on you? Here's the thing. In my own life, I've had to look back and realize the parts that I played and the parts that other people played. And the one circumstance that I can look at in my life and go, you know what? I truly am not to blame here is my childhood, and some of you may have heard me tell this, in my childhood, I was severely abused by a family member. I I have physical limitations today because of the physical abuse that I endured uh, two to three years old through five to six years old. Now, here's the thing. As someone who has been abused, the victim of abuse, I am statistically more likely to turn around and go on to abuse others in my life. But let me ask you this. Am I justified if I slap my son and I physically abuse my child? Am I justified in that action because I was abused as a child? No. My response is on me. Whether I have been a victim or not, the way I respond to that is my responsibility. And whether I decide to take the sin that was passed down to me and live that sin out in my own life and pass it on to someone else, that's on me, not on this family member that abused me. That's not their fault, that's my fault. You see, you are in complete control of your response to your circumstances. And when you cast blame on someone else because you're uncomfortable with what you've done, you are not taking responsibility. You're throwing that responsibility onto someone else. You're, I'm responsible for the ways we respond. That's not on anyone else. So stop blaming God and others for your circumstances. That's step one. Step two, make amends to those you have wronged, including yourself. Make amends to those you have wronged, including yourself. But what does that mean? What does it mean to make amends? Well, making amends is more than just apologizing. There is actually three parts 
to making amends. First, it's admitting what you've done. It's admitting this is the part I played, this is the sin I committed, this is the mistake I made. It's saying this is my part, this is what I did. The second is that you apologize for that. Once you admit it, you can then apologize for it. And then once you've admitted and once you've apologized, then you go and do what you can do to make the wrong right, to correct the mistake, correct the sin, correct the the falling short that you've done. So it's not just going and apologizing, although I think that's the first and biggest part of this. It's admitting, apologizing, and making things right out of what's taken place. And so how do you do that? Well, I think it begins simply with figuring out what and who you need to make amends to. So who is it in your life that needs to hear you say, I'm sorry? Who is it in your life that you've been casting blame on and you need to go to them and say, listen, God's been doing something in my life and I feel compelled through the Holy Spirit to come to you and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doing this or saying that or playing this role in the circumstances that you've gone through, the way I've affected your life. Imagine the healing that could take place if we simply went to someone and said, I'm sorry, what can I do to make this right? That can be life-changing for the lives of the people around us. So step one, stop blaming. Step two, make amends. Step three, Actively engage in God's plan for your life. Actively engage in God's plan for your life. Actively look for ways to stop the blame game. Actively look for ways to take ownership for the circumstances in your life and the way your life and your decisions and your sins have affected those around you. If we can begin the process of taking ownership and intentionally making a plan to take ownership in the future, we can change our lives and the lives of the people around us. But we have to make a plan. We have to be intentional about engaging in God's plan for our life. Don't be afraid to live in honesty with others. So think about it this way. I told you that first chapter, first John chapter one, verse nine was kind of the, the passage to focus on. Think about it this way. If you confessed your sin to God and in his faithfulness and in his justice, he forgave you and cleansed you of your unrighteousness as he promises he'll do in first John chapter one, verse nine, if you lived in that forgiveness and cleansing how would your life change and how would the lives of the, cha- the, the people around you change? If you called up that person that the relationship has been damaged for years because you blamed them or cast that blame on them and you didn't take ownership, what if you lived in the cleansing and forgiveness that God provides and passed that on to someone else that you forgave and you allowed forgiveness to consume and take over someone's life. How would your life and the lives of the people around you change? Join me in prayer.